Okay, so um, Elmer asked me to give you guys the first class on this topic that you guys chose. You guys had a vote, I guess. And you guys um, chose... It's, well, he said brokenness. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's actually a pretty uh, hefty or heavy subject. It can be. Um, but I thought it'd be good for me to kind of get a sense of what you guys had in mind or want to get out of this series. Because I, I, I prepared notes, but I kind of assumed what, what you guys meant by brokenness. And I realized it can mean a lot, you know. So um, does anyone, or actually, if you guys can just start with giving me uh, input of what you think brokenness means. What kind of brokenness do you have in mind, or did you have in mind, when you voted for this subject? I believe uh, it was a, at my point, I think it's like depression. Yeah, depression, okay. Yeah, all right, anything else? Yes. Huh? I think it's the opposite. The opposite? Yes, I think there's this misconception that brokenness is a bad thing, and that's when we, when I attended the study with Marilyn, that was my... Mm -hmm. First, like, oh, I'm gonna talk about being sad or being broken, and, but it's not like there's so much beauty found in brokenness, uh -huh. and like God wants us to be a broken, like, be a broken Christian. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very valid. And it's like the hardest thing. Yes. Yes. Anyone else with what they have in mind with brokenness? Okay, well, all right, so I think then I was along the same lines as um, what I thought when, when uh, thinking about brokenness. So, um, you know, as far as I can tell, there's like two kinds of brokenness, right? Um, what I would call a worldly brokenness and then like a godly brokenness. And I think that's, that may be the contrast between, you know, being broken in a bad way and then being broken in a good way, like Mandy was saying. Because, yeah, if you study the Bible, um, you will see that God loves a broken spirit, you know. <clears throat> so, um, you know, if I were to ask you guys, and, and Elmer really wanted to keep this, like, like, up close and personal, like, you know, get a little bit vulnerable, right? S to, to really make use of this class, because we can talk about brokenness in an abstract way, you know, the theory, the science, and the cliche, but, you know, we all, nobody, nobody's gonna benefit from that, but if we can get, if we can open up and uh, be vulnerable, I'm looking at you, Elmer, okay. um, <laughs> then, you know, we, we might get something out of this class. So, um, if I ask you guys, uh, who here isn't broken? In what sense, though? Spiritually or worldly? Just in any sense, right? I, I, I ask that question because asking who here isn't broken is just almost the same thing as who here doesn't have what? sin, mm -hmm. right? Because sin is a type of brokenness. And actually, uh, I would say that most brokenness can be traced back to sin. You know, that's not to say that it's always somebody's fault if they're broken, but a lot of times people are broken because sin was involved, not necessarily the person's, but somehow sin, you know, whether it was a friend or a family member or who knows, you know, sin is usually involved with breaking people. You know, to um, to severe levels. <clears throat> um, so, um, you, you guys think it's safe to say that we're all broken, in some way, shape, or form? You know, we all have certain things about us. And uh, but to Liz's point, like in what way? Um, how many of you guys feel like uh, 
like you've experienced severe depression, like uh, clinical type stuff. No? Okay, that's good. How about just like, um, you know, normal depression? Yeah, I think everyone goes through, you know, how about more than normal, like, like kind of heavy, not so much that you have to like get committed to a, you know, a psych unit or something, but you feel like you almost got there. Like it was pretty close. Who, anybody like gone through that? Like depression or like anxious, like anxiousness? De or? Like depression that, um, like for example, you don't know why bother with life or, you know, like, uh, not living. like, yeah, like depression, like you know, suicidal thoughts mm -hmm. or, like, spirit, like uh, I went through a spiritual depression that was pretty hefty. Uh huh. And or maybe anger with God, or just anger at the world, everybody, and uh, anything like that. Yeah, I went through that. Okay. Yeah, me too. Uh -huh. Um. All right. So I mean, brokenness can can be at an emotional level. You know, I think that's what everyone is kind of assumes. Uh, you know, we're all, we, we all have that familiarity because um, we all experience pain, loss, disappointment, uh, loneliness. Anybody here get lonely? Right? Yeah, I mean. We <laughs> know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, loneliness, it, um, before I got married, I was super lonely. And after I got married, I still got had bouts of loneliness. Like even after you get married, you get hit with the feeling of you're you're alone. Like nobody understands you. Nobody, not even your spouse. You know. So, um, but in a certain sense, you know, like even though we're all dealing with brokenness, in a way, I like the way that John Wesley puts it, because um, especially for Christians, um, sometimes. When you're at sea, there's all this turmoil on the surface. That way, when everybody sees that there's a hurricane or whatever, there's a storm, you know, waves tossing. But if you go deeper, it's still and it's calm. So in many ways, that's, that's how it is most of the time, especially for us as Christians, that on the surface, we're dealing with all this stuff and we feel like, you know, we're kind of getting tossed to and fro. But deep inside... Like at the core heart level, we have this trust in Jesus. Mm -hmm. We have this trust in God and that, you know, keeps us anchored, mm -hmm. right? And uh, that's how, um, you know, a lot of people we know, a lot of Christians that we hear about, that's how they're able to endure crazy things because they have that rock inside that you know, keeps them stable. Even though on the outside, they're, you know, they may be getting persecuted or... And you know, they would be dealing with loss. They just lost their husband or wife, or they lost a child, or who knows? You know, there's so many things, that, ways that uh, we can be broken. So um, there's that. But then, on the other hand, you know, what if you don't have faith? What if you don't believe in God? You know, that's when uh, it can really start. You know, creating havoc, chaos when you don't have uh, Jesus Christ in your heart, when you don't have that stability, you know, that's when you get uh, cases like, you know, what you hear about on, on TV of, you know, famous people committing suicide. In fact, that's one of the things I wanted to show you guys. Um, just a short video of uh, Robin Williams. Mm -hmm. You know, he was like, uh, it's, it's ironic, right? Because he was a comedian and he, he had, he was loved. By so many people, he made people laugh all the time, and uh, you know he ended up hanging himself. So you know that's uh, so there's that kind of brokenness. So uh, so what causes brokenness then? Something dark. Sin. 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 Okay. Yeah, we mentioned that, well, but. What else can cause, aside from sin, there actually is, if, if you um, study the Bible, there's also something, I guess, if, I, I'll give it away if I say someone. Someone else causes brokenness. Mm 
the devil? No. Well, the devil's sin, I would put that in the same category. You know who else causes brokenness? He's a direct cause. God? <laughs> yeah. Jesus. God. Yeah. God himself will break people, you know, for a purpose. So, um, <clears throat> I was going to, actually, I was going to read the Isaiah 66, 1 and 2 to start off, but I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> but here's what it says. It says, um, Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things my hand has made, and all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this one will I look, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit, and who trembles at my word. You know, it's, it's, uh, I like the way that uh, God puts it here because basically he, he says, I created everything. The universe, everything in it, the world, you know, all of it. But, but nothing takes its, his notice. Like nothing captures his attention. All of what he created, you know, the, the, the gorgeous uh, places and things that he has created. But none of that takes his notice as much as someone who is, yeah, exactly as a contrite spirit like that's who he looks to that's that's the person that he will look upon <coughs> um so yeah uh, do you have an iphone right can can i borrow it for a second just wanted to show you that video yeah. <laughs> It was no coincidence that Robin Williams' HBO tour was called Weapons of Self-Destruction. Ta-da! You are an alcoholic. And some people say, Robin, I'm a functioning alcoholic. Which is, you can be one. It's like being a paraplegic lap dancer. You can do it. Just not as well as the others, really. And perhaps it was no coincidence either that Williams did that tour in 2009, a year after a major operation. Please, I've had heart surgery, thank you. Surgery that he says triggered mood swings. But after the surgery, you get very emotional. It's like, you know, it's like weird people go, how are you? God, thanks for asking. For Williams, it was all fair game. When I was growing up, they used to say, Robin, drugs can kill you. And now that I'm 58, my doctor's going, Robin, you need drugs to live. Raw, <laughs> honest, self-deprecating humor in which William shares with the world his struggles with alcohol and drugs. I had a little problem with alcohol. It wasn't really a problem, everybody had it. But it was the idea of... You were a... I was, a, I was an hour, a drunk. You were a drunk. Now, do you think you've beaten it? No, Larry. It's always there. <laughs> yeah, I kicked it. <laughs> no, I'm fine. No, you, the idea is that you always have a little bit of fear, like you have to just keep at it. You know, it's a day by day. In 1982, as a young comedian, Williams famously partied with pal John Belushi, hours before the Blues Brothers star overdosed on heroin and cocaine. Cocaine, mm, what a wonderful drug. Anything that makes you paranoid, impotent, give me more of that. <laughs> Williams soon quit cold turkey and remained sober nearly two decades until 2003, then relapse and rehab here in 2006 for comic relief. It's always good for me to come to Vegas after rehab. I love that. <laughs> this is a good town for you. Good town for me. It's like going to Colombia, you know, going, where are you going for detox? Colombia. <laughs> Just to take it easy in a 24-hour alcohol town. In 2008, when his second marriage ended as a result of alcoholism, he says, Williams again went to rehab, joking about it with U.S. troops. I was violating my standards quicker than I could lower them. <laughs> Wherever he went, it seems there was always laughter. But with that came unbearable pressure. William suffered manic depression. You know, no, I'm not always fun to be around. And that there is this thing of, yeah, the world sees one thing, and what am I like at home? Different because I can't always be on. Surrounded by millions who adored him, loved him, yet in the end, could not save him. Good night! Deborah Thayerick, CNN, New York. Alrighty, so 
Um, I really like the this little video because um, I just like the way that it made the point that millions loved them and adored them, and you know, like, like he can uh, we can all portray something when we're around people. Um, thanks, Maria. And uh, you know, maybe some of some of the, like the funniest and fun people that we know can be suffering from uh, depression, right? I mean, it's it's crazy. Um, I don't know how many of you guys, did, did you guys watch that movie Watchmen? When it came out, it's, it was kind of a cult uh, movie. You probably didn't watch it, but I, um, there's a joke, it's kind of a joke, and, then I, and it really struck me. Because um, one of the guys was like, um, he was like, okay, so the joke goes, a man goes to, uh, a doctor, man goes to the doctor, you know, says he's depressed and says life seems harsh and cruel. He feels all alone in a, in a threatening world and, um, you know, and everything is uncertain and vague. He doesn't know, you know, what's supposed to do. So he's suffering from this, like, great depression. And the doctor says, oh, you know what? The treatment is actually pretty simple. There's this great clown. His name is Pagliacci. And he's in town tonight. You go and see him. He's going to pick you up. And the man just bursts into tears. He says, but doctor, I am Pagliacci. Mm -hmm. You know? So, I thought it just hit the point where people can reach a point where, like, there's absolute, just abject uh, hopelessness. Mm -hmm. Like, they don't see the end of the tunnel, you know, really. So, and that, that's what I want to maybe, obviously this, uh, I think this is supposed to be covered like three classes. Mm -hmm. So maybe in this class we can kind of go over like worldly sorrow, you know. And that's the kind of sorrow that leads to, um, can lead to suicide, can lead to, um, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff. And it leads to more sin, people get into addictions, drugs, um, so all kinds of craziness. So, worldly sorrow. Um, let's read, I think it's Second Corinthians. Chapter 7. Uh, verse 10. Can anybody read verse 10? For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading <coughs> the true salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Okay, so the sorrow of the world produces death. Mm. So, um, <coughs> worldly sorrow producing death. Where do you guys... What do you guys think when you guys uh, hear worldly sorrow? What kind of sorrow comes to mind? What could be what What could Paul have in mind when he said the sorrow of the world produces death? Just natural Maybe sorrow. Yes. Huh? Natural, natural sorrow? Like yeah, just yeah. like what though? It's not inside the church, not outside the church. It's just everybody's sorrow. Oh, uh, just the uh, uh, like famine and all that. That's okay. sorrowful, like anything okay. happening in the world. Yeah, okay. Sorrow of the world, like, uh, just, okay, like famines, war. Death and all that. Uh-huh, okay. You see the newspapers and all the news and, like, the protests and all that. It's not getting better. That doesn't lift anybody's spirit. Yeah, yeah, okay. Anything else? Mm. Like a broken home. A broken home? Yeah, not having your parents or having that support system. Uh huh. Um, sicknesses like cancer, tumors. Okay. Um, uh huh. Whether it's, you know, yourself or people around you that you love that are going through it, seeing them put through, getting put through that pain, um, relationships. Uh huh. Worldly sorrow leads to death. So, 
so I mean yes a lot of that stuff leads to death like uh, when I read this verse it's like you know he's obviously contrasting two kinds of sorrows right like a godly sorrow which leads to salvation repentance and then a worldly sorrow which leads to death so the kind of sorrow that can be worldly is the kind of sorrow that doesn't lead to repentance, right? Okay, it, it doesn't go anywhere. So, um, you know, and this is, I think, where we need to um, and maybe keep reminding ourselves that, you know, there's not just for ourselves, but for the people that we love. Um, you know, all I can think about really is like my own family, for example. Like my sister, I, I really hate to be uh, laundering or exposing dirty laundry when, you know, the first was not around or whatever. But like, I look at my sister. It's like, oh well. <laughs> it's like, oh yeah. <laughs> you know, without going into too much detail, you know, she, she, I can tell that she has a certain, um, resistance maybe or there's something about the whole church scene that um, that she just she stays away from it something that keeps her away right and and yes she has two kids and you know it, just a lot of family you know problems and when I see when I see the way that the choices that she makes it's like you know there's no there doesn't seem to be any repentance um, with her lifestyle or with how she wants to do things, you know, um, and basically, like, um, when I've been in a in a state where I've been, I feel like I'm going through some really hard times, and uh, it feels like really hopeless. There's something that, like, you, you realize after the fact that. Um, your hopes in something other than uh, God, other than His plan, you know, like, I mean, you guys are still young, you guys have your dreams and your goals, right? You guys have your, your stuff that you are looking forward to, and sometimes you, like, you really want those things, right? You really want, you, you think that's what's going to bring you the the joy exactly you know like what kind of stuff comes up when you guys uh, think about what's gonna bring you happiness and joy GTR what is it GTR what's that it's a car oh a GTR okay yeah a car having my money. own home <laughs> money having your own home yeah um, having yeah, but how, how, how are you going to go about getting peace? Like, what do you think is going to give you peace? I'm just, let's, let's keep it worldly. Let's keep it worldly. Worldly? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because we can all, oh yeah, you know, God is going to give me peace. Jesus Christ. <laughs> you know? But, I mean, you guys are humans just like me. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You guys live your life in this world just like me. And what are the things that come to your mind when you think what's going to give me joy and happiness and peace and you know all the things that I want what is it what is it I'm after so money money <laughs> we were just having a conversation with somebody actually this week and a Christian and she said education uh -huh. and financial stability is the goal uh -huh. for our life yes that's our purpose Ooh. and that's where I'm going to find satisfaction right exactly yeah that's uh-huh. What else? Money. Money. Okay. That's it. Uh, I don't know. Did I mention? I think I mentioned once. You know, um, like I have, I have a good job. I'm not, you know, I, I actually love my job. <laughs> I, I'm doing what I, what I love doing. Uh, and, and I have the financial freedom to, you know, go visit my family in Canada or, you know, take trips and stuff. Uh, ironically, am I happier now because of that than I was before? 
No, I'm not. You know, there's still misery in my life. There's still things that make me miserable sometimes. About your job or about different? No, now it's not my job. Like before, it used to be my job. Like I, I used to work at Fry's Electronics. <laughs> that was the worst for me. <laughs> you know, like it was a minimum. Uh, you know, I just gotten married. It was a minimum wage job. Middle management. They were just like to me. They were like the devil. You know, <laughs> seriously, like they didn't care about you. All they cared about were their numbers, how much you know, and and fries. Their 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 people actually get paid on commission, so you do have to kind of be salesy, mm -hmm. and you have to hit a quota and all that stuff. And you know, recently married, and Isaac was born, was on the way, and just struggling financially, and you know, so there was that stuff, right? I, you know, and I thought I only had a good job, you know, some money coming in and uh, and then you uh, you start making the money you may start actually getting the money or making the money that you always wanted are you going to be more happy after that are you gonna feel less broken after that you know it's it's crazy to, to be, it's hard to believe you know because uh, like Jim Carrey once said you know I wish everyone was rich did you guys hear that quote? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he said something like, I wish everyone um, was rich so that then they would realize, you know, something about that's not what yeah. makes you happy, yeah. you know, something like that. Because he, he pretty much achieved his dream of being like a top, you know, paid comedian or whatever. And, and yet he, you know. So, um, worldly sorrow. Um, so what I wrote down here is it's basically the way I understood worldly sorrow is basically any kind of sorrow um, where the person is just looking to themselves you know um, I don't have the life I, I wanted I don't have the things I want you know I don't feel the way I want to I don't do the things I Huh? Everything happens to me. Yeah, everything happens to me. Like it's it's centered inwardly. Like a pity party. Like a pity. Yeah, it is kind of like a pity party. Um, but at the same time, like I also thought, you know, and this always comes out. Like, what about um, like children being abused, right? Um, or like. You know, rapes, molestation. What else? Like family, um, losing your mom or dad or, or a spouse, loved one. You know, s stuff happens like that to to non-believers, right? And it can lead to a worldly sorrow. You know, how? How is it a worldly sorrow versus a godly sorrow? It's you know, the person is concerned about, um... Is it maybe, how do I say this? Is it maybe the action that comes from the sorrow that determines whether it's a godly or a worldly? Uh-huh. Yeah, okay. Like, you like, okay, so continue with that. <laughs> <laughs> it's the action that determines, so like when you react I'll so like away. when you're talking about these hard emotions, like I'm trying to think of like my life, like where I've experienced that, mm -hmm. and the, um, the thing that just keeps coming back is when Marilyn went through her, her mm -hmm. the cancer scare. Um, like I remember waking up those like three days that like leading up to the surgery, and like like when I would wake up in the morning, like for a couple of seconds. I was okay, and then I would literally, like, I would just start crying. Like, mm -hmm. so much sorrow, like, you're scared, like, you're praying, like, God, to, like, please listen, and, you know, you have, we've had people who have died from cancer, and you just start thinking, like, this is happening to my sister, and mm -hmm. so many emotions, and, and it's like, how do people who don't have faith, how do they, like, how do they endure this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do they turn to, like? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And either that could lead someone to like giving up and throwing themselves into alcohol or drugs or just this severe depression where they kill, you know, lead to suicide or 
it's going to lead the person to maybe, you know, mm -hmm. walk, walk the talk and really say you believe in God. Okay, well, like, now's the time. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, and I think, I, I think that's where I want to kind of, that's where I'm going with, with this whole worldly sorrow is um, if you are reacting in such a way where what, whatever brings you pain or whatever, you know, um, like there's like a million and one things to turn to out there that people turn to in order to deal with their brokenness, you know. Um, you can turn to drugs. That's an obvious one. Um, you can turn to work. My dad tells me of co-workers that he has that work 14, 16 hours a day. Like, for some reason, they just don't want to go home. You know? And, it, you know, my dad's like, you have a family. Like, you have a wife and kids, right? But, you know, they would rather be working than have to deal with their family issues, whatever they are. You know? Um, sports, uh, TV. And sometimes, you know, it's not even such a bad negative thing. Sometimes people go into, like, bodybuilding. They'll go into, exactly. like, you go to, like, an extreme. Yes. It doesn't necessarily have to be a bad extreme. It could be, like, a kind of, like, well, okay. flipped good extreme. Something, uh... Bodybuilding steroids. You know, no, but that's exactly <laughs> my point, is that not, not everything that people turn to has a negative connotation mm -hmm. to it, you know? Like, yeah, these bodybuilders, these, like, fitness freaks. I mean, they have, you know, they have, like, the perfect body, right? And, and yet, that's, like, you know, that's what consumes yeah. them. That's what consumes them. And to the point where, um, you know, they obviously don't have enough time to deal with their spiritual lives, right? Like, how can you, how can you realistically... Um, make time for God and your spiritual life if you devote so much time to all these other things. You know, that's worldly brokenness. You know, they, they, that's where they channel stuff. Um, so, so it's not just drugs or, you know, or bad things. It could be like good things. Things that we consider would be good. Like, I know somebody who gets piercings to release the pain uh -huh. that is their outlet. So to us, it might not seem like that who something, cares? yeah, yeah uh -huh. but with what intention is she doing uh -huh. it, you know? Yeah, like what, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of, it is a cliche to say, you know, um, everybody deals with their stuff in a certain kind of way, right? And it's a worldly kind of way if you're not dealing with your stuff by coming before God right. and laying it all out, you know, to Him, you know, because we can, uh, for me, it's computer techie stuff, you know, video games. I get immersed in new technology upcoming, you know, get, staying on top of that stuff. You know, that's what I like, get, you know, that's what I can lose myself into, you know, especially uh, with video games and computer games. Like, when I was a teenager, that's how I coped with stuff. I would just go into this fantasy world, right? I don't think about my real life. I just, you know, and I still do it now. If I'm perfectly honest, you know, you guys will, I get made fun of for playing that little uh, <laughs> mobile game, right? Clash of Clans. Thanks, Elmer, for introducing me to that. Uh, so, you know, but that's an outlet. And, you know, I know, I'm, I'm aware that that is a coping mechanism for my brokenness. You know, that's worldly sorrow, you know. And, 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 and Paul contrasts that with godly sorrow, which leads to repentance. You know, leads to you coming before God and, and just repenting. Um, and what are you repenting of exactly? It can't, you know, it's not necessarily... Um, you know, you're suffering because you sinned. But um, it's just in a sense that you're not coming to Him with everything. Right? You're putting your faith or trust in something else other than Him. You know? So that's, that can be the repentance that you're repenting of. 
you're, you're putting your faith in something other than drugs. Whatever, it, it can be, you know, it can be social media, it can be uh, Instagram, Snapchat, it can be just the adoration of your peers that you get, you know. Um, it could be work, it could be literally anything other than Jesus Christ and God. If that's where you go to to make yourself feel better, it's a worldly kind of sorrow. What time is it? Over. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's 10.50. Okay, so um, I think we pretty much said enough about this worldly sorrow. So maybe next class we'll go into the uh, godly sorrow. Um, so just to finish off, and just to kind of begin with the, the concept of worldly sorrow, I mean the concept, or just to begin with the concept of godly sorrow, um, you know, there's, there's, there's several ways that uh, God molds His children, right? And the Bible says that He is the potter, we are the clay, right? Mm -hmm. And so as the potter shapes the clay, so God is shaping us. Um, but what means and what ways does he shape us? What is, how does he shape us? Right? And, and that's, you know, when you, when you understand what the New Testament tells you and, and the, and the thing, the, the, how God, uh, dealt with his people in the Old Testament, what do you guys think is the primary way that God uses to shape his people? Yeah, suffering, brokenness, you know, but a godly type of suffering. So, you know, it's uh, it's a sweet kind of brokenness, you know, and that's, uh, I guess that's what we're going to look at next class. Okay, um, we'll end with that, and Jessica, can you pray us out? Yeah, uh, so we're going to pray out. Uh, okay.